A man wakes up in the middle of a desert, not understanding how he got there and who he is. Suddenly, he sees an old man trying to escape the chase. The guy helps the elderly man, but he dies in his arms, having had time to name numbers 554, advising him to go to him and tell him that he got out. After burying the stranger, the man makes his way to the village. He asks the cab driver to take him to the train station, but the driver does not understand the meaning of the word. He tells him about his daughter and gives her name, 832. The guy remembers the old man and asks to be taken to 554. The man finds her at the bar and delivers a message from 93, but the woman is frightened and asks not to be dragged in. At this point, footsteps and a barking dog are heard outside, and the girl tells the man to run. He makes his way to the fire escape and sees a man in a white suit at the bottom, tossing a grenade in his hand. Then the man becomes dizzy, everything in front of him swims, and he wakes up in a hospital room where the man in the white suit calls him number 6. Later he declares that there is no New York, but that number 6 has always lived in the village, as his papers prove. Number 6 is taken to his house, but he looks around and goes to the street, where he sees cheerful, happy people. He buys a map of the village, but there is nothing marked outside. A woman doctor catches up with him on the street and tries to persuade the man not to look for a way out, while he looks at the ghostly towers of high-rise buildings on the horizon. Then he jumps into an empty cab by the curb and drives into the desert. But as he climbs the mountain, he sees only sand and rocks in the distance. The action rolls back to an evening in New York, when Michael meets a girl in a bar. The next moment, the doctor finds him lying on the sand and takes him to the village. Waking up, number 6 tells him about the meeting at the bar, but he does not remember what happened next. After getting to the town, number 6 realizes that the numbers on the doors of the houses correspond to the names of their residents, and then he finds house 93. He searches the apartment, not knowing what he is looking for. At that moment, number 2 enters, accompanied by a young man. Again, he convinces the man that there is nothing but the village, to which number 6 reasonably observes. If the old man has been followed, it means that he has learned something. Then number 6 can also get to the bottom of it. Number 6 goes to 554 again, and the girl confesses that the old man had drawings of his life before he died. Meanwhile, the cab driver and his wife receive an invitation to number 2's house, where he begins to question number 6, who at this time promises 554 that he will not come back if she tells him everything she knows. And the girl gives him a drawing of her dream, in which number 6 recognizes the Statue of Liberty, which thrills the man, it means he's not crazy. And that means that there are others who dream of getting out of here. At this time, the leader of the village, number 2, goes to his wife's bedroom and puts pills in the insensitive woman's mouth. Just then, his son walks through the door, unable to understand number 6's confidence in the existence of another place. And number 6, meanwhile, comes to the cemetery and sees a grave prepared for 93. So the management is ready to fake his funeral to keep the rumors at bay. This is where the doctor finds him. Number 6 suggests that she lie down on the ground and look at the stars. There are millions of worlds out there, is there really only one? And where do the names of great men come from in his memories? Number 6 tells of a girl in his memories whose name was Lucy. In the morning, Number 6 goes to 554's bar, but is delayed on the doorstep when an explosion is heard in the room. When he comes to, he finds 554, but the girl dies, having managed to pass on 93's advice to go to the towers. The man tries to get the doctor to make sense of what happened, but the woman is frightened to death and asks him not to make things worse. Number 6 goes to Number 2's house, blames him for the woman's death and promises to find a way out. He runs toward the towers, but a huge white ball appears in front of him and the man faints. In his delirium, memories of a boy playing on the seashore flit before Number 6. In reality, he sees a man who calls him his brother. Number 2 tries to persuade him to admit his kinship, but Number 6 does not believe him, even when he shows him their childhood photographs and reminds him of the scar he suffered as a child. Number 2 convinces the man to see a psychiatrist. The brother takes Number 6 to his house, where he is greeted joyfully by his nephews. And the brother's wife announces that she has cooked his favorite meals and invites him to watch the show they never miss together. Number 2's son watches his father feed his mother pills, but hides, not wanting to give away his interest. Meanwhile, Number 6 expresses to his brother that everything around him is fake. He does go to the psychiatrist, and in the process he remembers Lucy. Then he tells her that he saw a seagull that lives by the water, and then it turns out that there are two doctors. Number 6 cuts the session short. Outside, his brother catches up with him, who has figured out how to get number 6's memory back. 
He takes him to the garage, where the man is greeted enthusiastically by his co-workers. It turns out that number 6 is a bus driver. The man gets behind the wheel and takes a tour of the village, while his brother acts as a guide, showing the local sights. Meanwhile, the psychiatrist reports to number 2. Number 6 is tormented by memories of another life, which simply cannot be. And then the head of the village confesses that his wife has become like this because of him, and that his son, if he recognizes his real father, can abandon him. He demands to do everything to make number 6 believe in this reality. At this time, the tour bus pulls out of the village, and number 6 sees an anchor in the sand. He swerves towards it and tries to convince the others that the object is real, there must be an ocean. He has visions of the two boys on the beach again, and his brother leads him to an abandoned building. This is where they played as children, but number 6 does not remember it. Later, the doctor tries to prove that these are false memories. Well, is someone going to make up another reality on purpose? Michael remembers Lucy again. Why did she approach him exactly that day, the day he was fired? A new day begins, where everything is as usual. Clear weather, constant soap opera and the bus tour, interrupted by number 2 to present his brother's family with a trip to a resort they won in the lottery. The man is overjoyed and hopes that number 6 will go with them, but questions about the sea stump the man. Meanwhile, number 6 catches the doctor looking at sketches of Big Ben and the Statue of Liberty, which he has taken out of his pocket. Number 6 accuses her of spying and recalls telling Lucy about his job as an analyst at a company called Summacore, watching surveillance tapes and collecting data on people. And when he realized he was violating the privacy of others, he became despondent. That night, Number 2's son asks his father about his childhood because he cannot remember it. Number 2 advises him to put all doubts about his family aside, while Number 6 has a dream about his brother entering the water, ignoring his cries. Later, he leads 313 to the ruins because he feels a strange connection to the place. And then, following his memories, he finds an old box with a note he wrote as a child. The doctor considers it proof that the village is real, but number 6 claims it is a trick, though he has his doubts. Michael has another flashback. He was explaining his reasons for leaving Summercore to Lucy when she suddenly admitted that she too worked for the firm. She told him that he shouldn't count on the stocking to stop after his dismissal. That same day, number 6 is stopped on the street by a woman on the tour bus. She once heard the sounds of the ocean in the desert. Together they drive to the desert, but no matter how much they walk across the sands, the woman can't find the place. Number 6's attention is distracted by a bus on its way to the resort. The man rushes to the village, where his brother's family is waiting for him at the bus stop. When number 6 finally arrives, they decide to take the work bus to the resort. On the way, number 6 notices the towers and heads toward them. But images of despair flash before his inner eye when his brother is lost in the ocean. The man screams at the foot of the anchor. The vision changes. Number 6 is now tied to a pole and number 2 puts a grenade in his mouth. There is an explosion and number 6 regains consciousness to the screams of his brother who begs him to pick himself up. Confused, number 6 apologizes for his behavior and is ready to accept 16 as his brother when he suddenly confesses that he is not. He has been forced to lie, he doesn't know what they want, but it has something to do with the other place and he fears for his life. But number 6 promises that together they can stand up for themselves. 16 joins number 6 and the winking woman in search of the ocean. When they finally find it, 16 happily runs into the water. Number 6 remembers his brother's disappearance and asks him to stop, but a huge white ball appears out of the water and the man disappears. Number 6 tells 313 about it and they go to the place together. But instead of the ocean, there are sand dunes in front of them. He returns to tell his family the news of his brother's death, but people are absorbed in the show. Number 6 screams in despair and is taken away by clinic workers, where number 2 comes and feels sorry for the man who has lost control of himself. He refuses to wear the number instead of his name, but cannot remember his real name and agrees to be number 6. Later, number 6 meets a man who takes him to number 2 for an important conversation, while 313 realizes he has been dreaming and tries to sketch out what he saw. In New York, Lucy tries to leave Michael's apartment, but he grabs her and demands that she tell the truth about why he's being followed. 
Number 2 introduces to number 6 village spy named 909 who is searching for those who dream of the other place. He suggests that the men work together for it benefits them both. One will do the job, the other will satisfy his curiosity. 909 tells him that the cell agents do not know about each other and it is likely that someone is watching them as well, while they are assigned to number 1955, a history teacher. One of his students has reported him. To get closer to the suspect, number 6 takes a job at the school. Observing a lesson about the history of number 2, number 6 asks a question about number 1, to which he receives the answer that there is no such thing and never has been. Later, number 6 tries to provoke the teacher by asking questions about other places, but the teacher does not budge, saying that he is fine with everything here. Meeting with 313 after this conversation, he shares his conclusions that everyone around him lives in fear. Later, 909 and number 6 observe the history teacher. He likes to swim and he always dines alone, which 909 finds suspicious. And to make matters worse, the teacher leads a group of runners who are prime candidates for dreamers. During this conversation, number 6 notices 313 ahead of the running group. The next day, number 6 holds a lesson and one of the students shows him the latest tracking machine. And he gives the students an assignment, find out who everyone is working for and what their goals are. That evening, number 2 gives his wife black pills and she wakes up. At night, number 6 and 909 climb onto the roof of the teacher's house and watch him with a camera. 909 asks his partner to fetch coffee from his truck, where number 6 finds surveillance log. He looks through it and discovers that he's the real 909's mission, and that 313 is also under suspicion. The couple is talking about their son when number 2 gives his wife a sip of wine and she falls back into a stupor and the man notices that a surveillance camera has been installed in his garden. At this time, the teacher also realizes that he is under surveillance and slits his own throat. Number 6 insists that the man must be taken to hospital. The next day, the cab driver is playing with his daughter in the backyard when a huge hole in the ground appears there. Meanwhile, number 6 searches the doctor's roof and finds a camera, not noticing that he himself is caught on the nearest camera. Number 2 calls 909 and shows the camera he found. He notes that his son is acting strangely and wonders if number 6 has had any contact with him. The agent denies it, but number 2 does not trust him. And number 6 follows 909 and sees him in a bar with the mayor's son. It becomes clear that the couple are romantically involved. Number 6 recalls Lucy's confession that she has been reading Michael's reports and understands why Semakor wants to stop him. And in the village, he visits the teacher in the hospital and asks for help finding the other dreamers. But the man denies his involvement in any activity. The conversation is interrupted when number 6 senses that he is being followed. He runs after the stranger but loses sight of him, unaware that he has been spied on by his student. The next day, number 2 gives number 6 an assignment to spy on 909. But the latter first wants to warn the doctor. Only the woman shows him her own surveillance photos. He's the agent himself, having climbed on her roof. At this time, number 2's son is waiting outside his house for 909. The agent suggests that they take a break because number 2 suspects them. Number 6 enters and finds them embracing. He demands that they stop following the doctor or their affair will become public. Later, the father informs his son about the surveillance and says that he doesn't trust 909. He is determined to get all of his agent's secrets out. And then number 2's son goes to 909 with a knife. But the agent doesn't even think about resisting. He turns his back on the guy, letting him kill him. Meanwhile, number 6 runs to 313's house, but only sees her being driven away in a black van. He runs to 909 for help, but finds him bleeding out. The agent asks number 6 to confirm that the dreams are true and dies upon hearing the confirmation. New York, Lucy tries to get Michael to admit why he quit his job, and suddenly she realizes he is already with those people. In the village, number 6 finds number 2's son in the bar and asks him to help find 313. Number 2's son sends him to the tunnels, a place inhabited by unmasked dreamers, passing the men off as sick 909. In the tunnels, number 6 finds his apprentice, who in turn helps him to find the doctor. But while they are looking for a way out, the white ball appears. Number 6 then wakes up in his apartment as the men in the white coats emerge from his door. Meanwhile, number 2 informs his son about the death of 909 and asks him to find a peer. 
New York. Lucy says that she hears the name Curtis whispered on the decisions floor and insists that they go to Semaquar immediately. Michael kicks her out. She writes down the number and asks him to call her if he changes his mind. In the garden of the palace, number two treats the student to ice cream and thanks her for stalking number six. Then he exposes her for spying on him as well, so the girl has to go to therapy. At this time, number six wakes up to the voice of a woman announcing on TV that it's time for him to find a romantic couple. He goes to 313 and she explains that this is how all couples find each other. Meanwhile, a big hole in the ground is forming in number two's yard, which he attributes to climate change. Number six goes to the Modern Love Bureau. At first skeptical, he is delighted when the system pairs him up with 415, a blind woman who looks just like Lucy in New York. In the meantime, number two has a conversation with the doctor. He knows that she's a dreamer and she will have to betray number six, even though she loves him. And number six goes to C415. The girl explains that her blindness is the result of childhood trauma. He tries to convince her that they have met before in another life and recalls how close they were in New York. Then the girl says she doesn't usually act so impulsively. And 415 agrees to go to number six apartment. The action jumps to different times. Number six does not understand where he is Michael and where he is in the village. He tries to prove to Lucy that they have met in a past life. The girl freaks out and leaves. The next morning, number two observes his son stealing samples of pills from the safe. The boy takes them to the clinic and asks 313 to determine their content. Later, the father warns his son that once he learns the truth about the holes and his mother, there will be no turning back. Meanwhile, number six and 313 visit the cab driver and his family. The cabbie shows them the hole in his backyard. While the adults are distracted by champagne, the little girl falls into the hole and disappears. The loudspeakers in the village announce that every house should have a pig to combat weather anomalies, as their breath is a proven atmospheric stabilizer. The hole in 147's yard is backfilled, after which number 6 goes to number 2, hoping to find out where the girl disappeared to. But he leads him to his pit and advises him to marry 415 or to jump into the pit and find out what's in there firsthand. That night, the doctor under number two's supervision injects number six and 415 with a hormone drug that makes people fall in love. The next day, number six visits 415's father and he convinces him to think about marriage. In the evening, 313 meets number two's son and reveals the ingredients in his mother's pills. One, a strong sedative, another, a hallucinogen, and another of unknown origin. In the meantime, number six tries to ease 147's family's suffering from a missing child while the doctor finds herself in number two's bedroom, where she sees number two's wife sleeping. The man is interested in the possibility of reversing love. 313 speaks affirmatively, but she's again such a way of winning the man over. That night, 313 goes to number six and confesses her feelings as he falls asleep. People from the clinic arrive and take him away. The doctor injects him with the drug, but the man wakes up and number two confesses that they caused his love artificially. But the man disagrees with this statement, his love is real, and he intends to marry 415. New York. Lucy and Michael wake up together. Lucy feels that she is not being her usual self and tries to leave, but Michael offers to cook breakfast for her. The girl asks for oranges. The man's consciousness is double again. He proposes marriage to Lucy and 415, and both respond by saying yes. On their wedding day, the doctor shows up at the church to tell number six that his feelings for 415 will not last. When the bride arrives, 313 kisses number six. Sensing this, 415 runs off into the desert. Number six catches up with her moments before the white ball attacks. The two women take turns flickering. Lucy convinces Michael that she needs to leave because she brings danger. And 415 is knocked down by the bright flash and the wave from the ball. Number 6 calls her Lucy and tells her about their meeting in New York. She tries to deny it but eventually agrees with what he says. Number 2 brings her to the village to break his heart. Distraught, number 6 comes to equally distraught 147, who wants to jump into another pit to find his daughter. Number 6 is trying to convince him not to, and while he restrains his friend, 415 jumps into the pit. At this moment, his apartment in New York explodes, which Michael, who was carrying Lucy the oranges, sees. Number 2's wife in New York opens her eyes. In New York, Michael tries to get into his apartment, but is chased away. Lucy, in her recorded message, asks him to stay away from Summer Corps, but Michael rushes there. 
Distraught, number six screams at the palace gate, vowing to avenge the death of 415, without noticing his double looking at him from across the street. Later, number two finds his son in the bar. The son accuses his father of lying and demands to know where the village is, and he admits that he is in his mother's mind and that she did all this for him. Number two gives his son the key to the safe with the pills, offering him a day with his mother. 313 wakes up and finds number six sitting at her bedside. He recalls their kiss and reaches for her, but the woman asks him to stop. Number six leaves. The next day, number six comes to see her at the clinic. He mourns the death of 415 and tries to find out what is in the hole. 313 wonders why he didn't worry about it last night. Confused, number six claims he never went to her house. And when he goes outside, he discovers that he got into a fight with the cab driver yesterday. Confused, number six returns home. His apartment is in ruins, a receipt from a grocery store is on the floor, and the words see you later are written on the mirror. New York, Michael's pass is already deactivated, but he convinces the security guard to let him go down to the basement for a new one. Number six goes to the store, and he learns that he bought a knife here yesterday. He tries to convince 147 that his previous fight was with an imposter, and then he sees his double. He rushes out in pursuit and catches up with him. But the doppelganger knocks number six to the floor and puts a knife to his throat. He demands to kill number two, who is responsible for the death of 415. Then he stabs him in the face and disappears. Number two prepares to leave the palace and finds number six breaking through his bodyguards to warn him of the appearance of the double who is going to kill him. But number two begins to behave strangely. He refuses to go in his car and goes for a walk in the village on foot, throwing off his suit. Meanwhile, number two's son sees a message with a warning about the appearance of his father's double and wakes up his mother. Number two, meanwhile, walks into a store and asks for cigarettes. The salesman reluctantly hands him a cigarette, then smokes with him, but after he leaves, the man calls the clinic. Mother and son are having lunch, during which the boy pokes his mother for information about other places. But the woman convinces him that the village has everything he needs for him. Number six again tries to warn number two of the danger, but he calls himself a vagrant without a number and is not afraid to die. Nevertheless, when he sees number six double, he agrees to get into the cab driver's car. And he takes him to his home to protect him from being caught as a wanderer without a number. Meanwhile, Michael goes to get a new card and recognizes the man as the village shopkeeper. The access specialist is skeptical until Michael proves that they share the same memory. 147 and his wife treat number two to cake until agents searching for the double arrive. Number two flees while his wife goes out for a walk without noticing the formation of a new hole in the yard. Later, number two comes to 313 and wonders if she wants to see the other place. He promises to grant her wish, even against her will. At this time, the son again asks his mother for permission to go to the other place. And the woman confesses that the holes appear when she is awake. And she also adds that the people born in the village cannot live anywhere else. The distraught son runs out into the desert and throws away the key to the pill cabinet. Meanwhile, 313 seeks solace in the arms of number six, but realizes it is a double. She runs away, haunted by new visions, and finds herself in the middle of the desert, while number six tells number two's son about the doppelganger and his intentions to kill his father. The boy names the location of number two and confesses that he recognized him. He is the doppelganger and the killer. In the village church, number six finds number two, and he confesses that he created the village because he wanted a fresh start, free from the apathy and the cruelty of the real world. But apparently he was wrong. He recognizes the doppelganger and he's not afraid to die. The doppelganger grabs number two while the real number six appears. He stops the double. They will only win if they unite. At this point, number six's double disappears while number two's son finds the key in the sand and puts his mother to sleep again. Number two returns home, explaining that his double has been found and apprehended. The shopkeeper is dragged to the clinic. In the middle of the desert, 313 finds a glass door with the Samacore logo on it and goes inside. At the same time, Michael and the master go to the task floor. In a room filled with monitors, profiles of the villagers are displayed. Michael recognizes the people as subjects from his reports. On one monitor, he watches Lucy's recorded warning until 313, following a long corridor, encounters a vision. She flees back into the desert. 
Michael goes to the window on the floor and sees Village Street and number 6. He knocks on the window trying to get his attention, but he looks toward the towers and turns away and leaves. Meanwhile, new residents arrive in the village who cannot answer where they come from. And at some accord, the winking woman from the tour bus informs Michael that a car is waiting to take him to Mr. Curtis. In the village, number 6 receives a summons to the clinic, where he shares with 313 his concerns. The village is expanding, apparently number 2 is up to something. At that moment, the doctor receives his test results and is frightened. At the same time, looking around the village, number 2 tells his son that all of this is his inheritance. Their conversation is interrupted by number 6, who wants to know exactly why he's now certified to die. Number 2 replies that he has exhausted all means to convince him to live peacefully in the village or not to live at all. In the meantime, 313 continues to be haunted by visions from another life, but Number 2 warns that she must not let the girl from the other place control her. Otherwise, she will not be able to help Number 6. At the cemetery, Number 2's son lays flowers in the grave of his friend 909, where Number 6 meets him, asking him to help everyone get out of the village. The boy claims that his mother cares for him, but number 6 warns that she is also killing all hope in him. Later, number 6 faints in front of 147, who offers to take him to someone who might be able to cure him. In New York, Michael is escorted to Mr. Curtis's car, where he recognizes the driver as 147 from the village. On the way, the driver explains that he used to be an evil man, but Mr. Curtis helped him change his life. In the village, 147 takes number 6 to the village prophet, and he tells him that the deliverance is coming, they just have to wait. But number 6 has no intention of giving up. He goes to see number 2's son, who is drinking alone. The man asks him about his mother and the pills, and offers to run away with him, but the boy refuses, he has a case to finish. In the New York City, Michael visits Mr. Curtis, who turns out to be number 2's prototype, and his wife, who is in a dreamlike state. Mr. Curtis explains that the village is an experiment taking place in the woman's mind. She sacrificed herself so that broken people could have a better life, if only in her mind. At this time, number two's son enters his parents' bedroom and strangles his mother to death. Mr. Curtis confirms that it was Michael who found everyone in the village. Meanwhile, at the clinic, number two taunts dying number six with details of his upcoming funeral. Later, Number 2 returns home to find his wife dead and his son missing. He and his assistants search the bar and discover that his son has hanged himself. Number 2 takes his body out and places it in a glass coffin. More and more earth holes begin to open up in the village. Number 2 visits 147 and asks that at just the right moment, the man shout the phrase that Number 6 is the first. Back in New York, Mr. Curtis shows Michael the positive impact of the village on suffering people. The man recognizes the inhabitants of the village, who here in real life are cheerful and contented. And yet he is convinced that people should not be helped without their consent. Mr. Curtis offers Michael the opportunity to continue the experiment and gives him a pass to the Summer Corps' main floor. At this time, Number 2 offers 313 a way to save Number 6. Number 2 finally realizes that Number 6's weakest point is his humanity. He is so right that he wants to live his life according to his conscience. If she wants to save him, she must give herself to number 6. Later, he reminds number 6 that the doors are open, and he can go wherever he wants. But first, he must confess that he needs the village, and it is his fear that causes the white ball. Number 6 sees this object, and unable to confront his deepest fear, runs away. The villagers gather for number 2's son's funeral. Number 6 comes too, for his fever has miraculously passed. Number 2 reads the eulogy and confesses to the crowd that his son's death was suicide and that they are all prisoners of the village. At this time, in a New York church, Mr. Curtis introduces Michael to Sarah, 313's prototype. She is mentally ill, suffering from the effects of childhood abuse. The man tells Michael that he worked with the girl for a long time until she resisted. Meanwhile, Number 2 admits that he cannot save the village and soon everyone will be in the abyss. The child throws a stone in Number 2's face and he points to Number 6. He can answer all their questions and he calls him Number 1. Mr. Curtis asks for help to cure Sarah, for Michael is Number 1. The crowd begins to chant that Number 6 is Number 1 and will save them all. Number 2 tells Number 6 that the only way to plug the holes is for a dreamer to take his wife's place. 
That's when 313 steps forward and takes the pills. Michael takes Sarah by the arm, catching her as she falls. And number two puts a grenade in his mouth. He gives it to number six and pulls out the pin. Mr. Curtis returns home and finds his wife healthy. On the appointment floor, Michael takes over as the new head of Summer Corps. On the high ground by the village, number six and sleeping 313 look out at the world around them. The man confesses that he has only now realized how beautiful it is here and intends to create a good village. 313 sheds a tear. The film is quite complex. It is not always immediately clear what is real and what is a flashback or hallucination, especially when it comes to the same characters. But everything is redeemed by a rather unpredictable ending, which explains all the strangeness of the plot.